Vincent just mentioned, I am head of engineering of Ubuntu client, so responsible for the distribution of the desktop that you install, um, phone, tablet, and whatever else we do on the client side. Um, on a non-commercial um, perspective, and then we have a commercial team that's actually like engaging with partners and prioritizing the distribution. Um, if my accent hasn't given me away yet, I'm German. Uh, however, I spent over a decade working for SUSE, which eventually was acquired by Novell, and so that brought me to Utah. First, just on you know, company for business trips, then I met my future wife there, which is my current wife. And so that's had me settled to them, living up in the Beehive, just enjoying Utah. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a couple of technology choices we made in Ubuntu, um, specifically with the focus of taking a Linux distribution to become a phone, that, phone product that we just commercially launched um, earlier this year. Um, now, the group size allows it to be really interactive. I plan for some Q&A at the end, but if you have questions at any time, you know, feel free to ask any time and we can dive into there. Um, <coughs> So, four years ago, when I joined the Canonical team, um, our task was to build a phone and tablet, um, that convergence product that Mark Shuttleworth is always talking about. And so, we sat down and looked at, you know, just an inventory of what does it look like. And like any other Linux distribution, it's just like this big conglomerate of all the open source goodness. You know, there's Qt components in there, GTK components in there, um, across the board. It was rather not manageable. So um, we put an architecture in place that's scalable and that allows to go after the larger goal of conversions. Conversions for us is the idea of having a user experience that you can use on your small four screen, a four inch um, phone screen um, that might even act like a mini tablet or your seven inch tablet, 10 inch tablet, your desktop, your laptop, and then your 50 inch TV, right? That's kind of a, what we did, what we showed at CES in 2012. Um, and so catering to all those use cases, um, we have put um, a design in place that allows consistent design language across all those form factors. So, um, the look and feel is always the same. Mac OS and iPhone or iOS <coughs> are getting there, but you know it's, it's quite a while for them to converge on the user experience. Um, with that consideration, however, we're again looking at doing our status quo inventory of technologies that we have. We looked at Unity, which the old version we call Unity 7, um, and that's the desktop shell in Ubuntu, and it had all the design elements, and it was built on top of our own toolkit, for example, which was called Max. <coughs> well, it's not our own, but we heavily invested and sponsored it. Um, but we figured the architecture of Unity was not scalable. So at one point, we had to make a tough decision, you know, how to take it forward. And so I'm just trying to tell that story a little bit that led us to this here. Um, any who's not using or has not heard of Ubuntu so far. Great. So I think the biggest controversial topic that I've seen in my career at Canonical was um, the display server discussion we had in 2012, um, when, again, as part of the assessment, we were looking at how far can we go with X. We figured X is a 30-year-old technology catering to mainframes and desktops, maybe and has done a good job until then, but it wasn't necessarily up for the game for what you want to do in the mobile space, where you, uh, performance, power consumption, security, all those things are important. You can work around in X, but it seems for us like a technology that's not up, up to the game. Um, so then we were looking at alternatives um, that are out there. At that time back then, um, you know, there were other projects that were going for phone there was Nokia, there was Ola, and all the other <coughs> um, parties. Um, and so Wayland was obviously like the big other option. And looking at Wayland, um, which is a protocol definition, uh, we figured by the time we 
go through this decision by the committee making process as part of the larger Wayland community, um, and then still having to implement the protocol um, because Westland is um, announced as their um, test implementation of the protocol. We figured we might as well just do it our own because we have to move fast. Um, we're at a very aggressive schedule. Um, and so, again, this decision making in a larger community, we were like, not sure if this is allowing us to go as fast as we want. Um, the quality of Western wasn't up to our standards. We wanted to do like total test driven, agile approach. And a test implementation doesn't necessarily lend itself you know, to, to be successful for that purpose. And hence, we started um, the display server. And I'm going to talk about that in one of the next slides. Um, now, at the end, the, the architecture of, of Ubuntu um, is what you see here, where we have an, an application layer on top um, that's speaking to a platform API. That was one of the other problems that you have in Linux, because there's lots of platform APIs. They all change. And so um, we invested quite a bit um, in abstracting um, the lower level parts of the operating system. Um, all the kernel bits, hardware enablement, and then talking to all the like, sensors, all those devices, uh, into one common API uh, that's controlled, that's tested, that's documented, and that's out there. Because when trying to do a phone, one of your biggest problems is you need to attract a community of developers. Otherwise, your phone you know, is a dialer, and that's it. Um, and so it was really important for us to have um, a great API design here. Um, Based on that, um, we made a decision to go with Qt and Qt related technologies, QML specifically, um, for for our product, and that applies to the to the user interface um, part of the stack mostly, um, where Unity 8, as I mentioned before, so Unity 7 was there, it was written in Max and GTK, was not scalable to the extent that we wanted it. Um, so we chose QML, um, a JavaScript type, um, declarative language, um, and we rewrote the whole shell within months in QML, which in itself speaks for the power of that technology. Like a shell is a rather complex thing, um, and the interactions and app stacking, switching, launchers, and then it had to be an adaptive design depending on so to cater to the conversions um, user experience that I was mentioning earlier. And so going with QML was proving to be really a good choice for us. Um, now, the display server was a really dumb memory manager in the end. It's just a buffer management, so managing services and talking to the hardware. Um, but there was the other problem that we had with our first pitch as a phone. If you don't have a hardware partner, you typically don't have drivers. And so there's ways to make X work and so on and so forth on, on ARM-based platforms, but it's not, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily, again, up to the level that we wanted. Um, luckily, at that time, back in 2012, the Pyrus came up, um, which is um, extracting the Android help and, and all the services beneath um, and, and interfacing it into the Linux uh, world. And so we were working together with them, investing in the Pyrus. That allowed us to be driver compatible to Android. So all of a sudden, our position was gear OEM. If you already have an, a device that's enabled for Android, you know Ubuntu will run on it with 99% likelihood without any changes. Hardware enablement is one of the most costly um, items in your phone when you do a phone, and so that was a really compelling argument for for OEMs and for hardware partners. However. What it also means is we need to be back compatible with Android because the drivers won't change, the software has bugs, and so we experience that it's probably not 99% likelihood, more like 98% likelihood, because there's bugs in those drivers, um, specifically in the graphics stack, um, where our architecture doesn't necessarily you know, fit in. So we were talking to ODMs in that case, or we, we understand what's going on on the Android side, and as I said, try to be back compatible. Um, so everything you see here in, in orange or in orange tint or the yellow tint is 
actual Ubuntu, Linux, GPL, um, all open source. The Pi version itself is open source. And then underneath you have the Android services that's running an LXC container uh, on top of the Linux kernel, the Ubuntu Linux kernel. Um, and that allows us to just interact with the hardware through that container. Um, so that has proven to be really good. The performance penalty is nil. You know, it's in the low percent um, range. Um, we are measuring specifically on the graphics side, like frame rates and um, reaction response time, and we're like up to par with Android, which is not good. <laughs> a little bit of luck, but also really good design of the stack. Um, now, this was the first iteration of what we wanted to do, the phone, but then we also at that time had a tablet and a TV um, in place, slightly different hardware platforms, um, specifically then when we extended to, to the x86 digital based world. Now, one benefit in designing the, the stack like this was that all of a sudden we had, instead of the LXC container, you have a platform abstraction. It doesn't matter if you know if you know your access your devices, your sensors on your x86 laptop just through whatever Linux drivers you have or the Android drivers. And so we have one common interface and the rest is just abstractness in that container. And that allows them to really quickly port that stack that we had running on a phone and a tablet all of a sudden over to the desktop. And that inclination is um, what we call desktop next for a while. Um, so we have a bunch of distribution, which is a bunch of desktop, and then there was sort of the next generation of it where we just put that technology into an image, made it available for people to download, we started that community of people you know, that wanted to test it, developers that wanted to give it a try, write um, applications on top of that stack rather than write you know, regular Debian-based, X-based applications. It was a good experience. Um, and again, it allowed us to move fast. Um, so on the graphics side, and that's where I started, Mir, our display server, um, key capabilities of any display server are those bullets that you see here. So where you want to do some copy and paste uh, between applications, right? You just expect that to work. Um, you expect to have certain input devices, um, pointers, key, boards, but also input methods was one of the considerations um, you have to take into account. Um, obviously, we want at the end of the day a shell user interface running on top of it that has components such as application switching, app stacking, window management, and all that. <coughs> um, output management, so running one or multiple displays um, locally or external displays um, was one thing that we need to take into account. And then obviously like the compositing aspect of, of a display server, doing this in a really energy efficient, performant way. Um, we spent a lot of time researching and drafting it before we actually set down the code, like implemented it entirely. Um, but as I said, it's you know just um, a height memory manager. That's what the display server really is uh, when it comes to managing all those surfaces. For the graphics stack, um, as I said, so that's a slightly different view, um, more geared towards app developers and, and, and end users. Um, so we still have our, our platform down here. Um, there's a layer, a system compositor, and that allows us to like write a boot as soon as the kernel is, is um, loaded and we start the unit system. Um, the system compositor is taking over the display and that allows for like a smooth booting experience um, where you don't have flickering as you used to have in the past where you first went into TTY and then X started and then your login manager started and it was always like flickering. So having the system compositor up and running at the beginning, everything can be controlled there. We have, don't have, have, I don't think we have it implemented, implemented yet. Um, but you can even do like fancy heat splash type of animations done at this stage. <coughs> um, so far, I think it just shows the about um, logo. Now, within that system compositor, we have um, a session compositor, and that's the managing specifically um, relevant for multi-user systems. 
the individual sessions when you can have multiple people logged in. And here's a process uh, barrier where you have two different processes, which that allows you to do really um, app confinement and encapsulation because it's just they don't see each other. There's no way for one user to uh, for any kind of high check another session and so on and so forth. So there was a security consideration. Um, on top of Unity 8, uh, on top of the session repository is Unity 8. So that's our desktop shell um, within the management and all those functions I mentioned before. Um, and that's what you see when you log in to any um, Unity 8 driven Ubuntu device right now. That's all great. That's all good. But what about apps? Um, as we stepped away from apps and like any Linux application today is, you know, that with graphic user interface, it's rendering through X. We had a problem in terms of enabling those apps. Now, the easiest way was um, to have native toolkit support uh, in Qt. Choosing Qt further down um, as a base technology allowed us to really quickly implement um, a mere backend into Qt as a plugin. And so, um, Qt can now render into X, kind of um, into Mir, and that, that's all fine. And that's excuse me, driven by just a small um, client uh, library that they have to implement. Um, and so any voices you hear on the internet that KDE will never run on on Mir, it has to be seen because you know we run already. KDE is Qt based. UTA is cute based, so the gap should not be really big to, to close it. Um, so that's all good. Um, we have taken a decision for our default apps, for our native apps, um, to be written in QML, so our like, key um, toolkit. Um, and so any application written in Qt QML would just work fine um, right there without any changes. You would we will talk about that a little bit later. However, so you could make Skype, for example, run. Skype, the Linux kind is this one was in Qt, uh, right there, but it doesn't inherit all the, the shell integration, the desktop integration that you would see, um, or that you would be used to. So like the, the, long, uh, the indicator icon, for example, and all those notifications. Um, you have to do extra work. Um, but again, what about those gazillions of, of X apps that we already have out in, in the ecosystem? Um, so we had taken different approaches um, how we could make it work. Uh, at the time of Ubuntu 14.04, we have announced, well, prior to that, 13.04, we have announced that Mir and Unity 8 will be um, the default for Ubuntu 14.04, which was an LTS, which was like a big thing because LTS is long-term support, supported for five years, and people were skeptical, you know, whether we could implement that change within a year's time and have the same level of quality and features that. We now, we took a slightly back then. We took a slightly different approach where the integration wouldn't have happened at the toolkit level, but at the X level where we would use the TDX uh, a driver model within X would have needed some extensions to talk to the hardware. It all worked fine on the um, open graphics drivers, um, the loose graphic drivers. Um, obviously, the binary drivers, um, NVIDIA and ATI needed some work. And um, at one point, then we said, you know, it's probably too intrusive of a change, and we'll, we'll just step away from that approach. Now, the good thing um, of that is, there's a good lesson learned, and we ended up calling it rootless X. Um, if you're familiar with, with X, there's always a root window. So if you boot into any Linux or any system that runs X, what you see, the desktop, the big window that fills up all your screens, the root window, in any other window, be it a menu or an application or an amplification or whatever else, is a child within that or under that root window. <coughs> part of the X architecture. Now, there's a way to run um, an X app in a confined way without an X um, root window. And so 
we took our experience from that 1404 approach um, through the DDX and have uh, something that we call the XMIR, which is the actual integration um, where X can render. So the MIR will provide the buffers and the surfaces, and X will render in those. Um, and so rootless X is essentially a small container running an X server rootless. It's a really small memory footprint. It's like you know, 30 megabytes or so. And then you can run your X app on top of it. And boom, all of a sudden, we have access to all those Windows apps that you're used to. So uh, it took a while to get that right and get the performance right. Uh, obviously, that's another layoff in direction or redirection. Um, but unless you're like a high FPS gamer, there's like literally no impact visible to you. Um, and so that's the story how we enable the graphics stack. Um, I have a question. For yeah. the memory footprint, is that a per application or is that a rootless X? It would be per application because it's in a small X server per app. Okay. Um, again, on with, you know, few dozen of megabytes, we think it's, it's, it's usual. Um, you on a desktop type of system, right? On a uh, smaller like phone or tablet system, you could argue that memory is quite, you know, you don't have as much RAM. Um, but then you probably wouldn't want to run the office on a small, you know, phone. But I'm going to tell a story later, actually, that will want you to, where you want to run um, the office um, on a So, all right, for developers. Um, now, I tried to tell the story so far of like how we were able to enable the hardware, different like architectures and platforms, um, having one single architecture of the system that allows us to scale across those platforms and across um, different device types, if you will. Um, but again, like having a compelling developer story was one of the big um, topics that we needed to address early on. Going back to conversions, um, it's really important to have a consistent design language that the behavior of the system is the same across all those form factors, because that's sort of the initial movie effect that you want with conversions, that you know, the user coming from a Ubuntu desktop is used to the launcher and the indicators and all those shell components how he interacts with it. And so um, we needed to make sure that the, device, the design in itself also scales across those uh, different device types. For example, the launcher, um, which is on the left side, um, which has all the running apps or pinned apps. You know, on, on your desktop, it you know, can pin quite a lot of apps. And it's, it's easy to see them on your smaller resolution uh, phone and tablet, it's becoming a problem. You know, we have users that have 20, 30, 40 apps in it. And all of a sudden, we just have this big harmonica of four black kids, right? It's not visible. So, we had to do some um, think about, hard about the design and how we would address that, um, how we would make that possible. Um, that is all um, embedded in, in design guides and patterns that our design team is publishing. Uh, and those are actually the input for the SDK and for the components that we that we provide you as a developer. Um, and so um, there's guides regarding um, you know writing a conversion app. And you know, obviously, if you want to live within the Ubuntu ecosystem, if you can write an app once uh, and run it on all those uh, different types of, of hardware, you know why wouldn't you do it? Sometimes it's just not in your interest or so. But the, the SDK and our guides enable you to do that. Um, and it's literally like write once and run everywhere. And it's also with the SDK, you know, it's, it's um, platform independent. So you write your QML code um, and you can push it on your, on your ARM based phone or you just run it locally on your desk, x86 desktop and you can test it locally without deploying. It's all the same code. You don't have to do any specific um, hardware 
um, abstractions or in your code. You might as well provide it through our platform API that I mentioned before. Um, you can run apps locally, natively on your system, but sometimes when you want to interact, you know, you might not have the touch screen um, on your laptop, but you want to test you know, it. And we have a phone emulator that not only emulates like the user input devices that you have on the phone, but also like the radio stack and stuff like that. And so that's that's another offering um, that we have in, in as part of the SDK. Another really important point is um, resolution independence. Just as I said, you want to address devices from a four-inch screen up to your projector or your you know, 70 or whatever is the biggest TV right now. Um, and as a developer, we want we don't want you to worry about your layout, right? Because we don't want you to write an app that's targeting a 70-inch um, TV. We want to write you an app tell the app how to behave, what's the, are the interactions, um, and you know, be done with it. And so we have a concept of grid units, which is essentially defining, uh, putting coordinates over the, the screen, and then depending on this uh, pixel density, DPI, uh, we scale that, and it allows you to have consistent design. Um, and as I said, we have um, native support on our stack for QML and HTML5 apps. Um, the, the rational really was, apart from like a technology decision, was there's so many JavaScript kiddies out there. You know, don't, don't be offended if you're a JavaScript developer, but there's just like this large developer base there. It's 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 easy to get in. Um, QML being really close to, to JavaScript. You know, we saw all of a sudden like this big spike of developers. Uh, that were coming in um, and and writing apps for us. We wanted to be part of, of that movement, if you will. Um, put them in the store. We have a store infrastructure that allows you to sell your apps on the rep share base, you know. And on the phone, um, we have actually a few apps that are community contributed that are part of the standard um, install on any phone that you ship right now. So like music player and calendar and stuff like that. So that was, you know, all of a sudden, we were able to enable developers, which wanted to be part of what we're doing. Um, pretty much was a good bit of situation. And similar for HTML5, you know, there's a large base of web developers out there that all of a sudden could get their apps in. We provide them, we can talk about that in the next slide, actually, uh, a container that allows you to bring your uh, web app in without lots of work. And then one novelty, um, one of the setting propositions for the phone is, the, is our scopes. And um, we have like full scope framework support in the SDK. Um, the SDK itself, the IE, is a huge creator base. Again, we could inherit um, to existing technology without having to reinvent the wheel. So um, this is just a quick comparison of how, how an app code would look like in QML or HTML5. Um, as I said, joking at the beginning, I'm a developer to me, it's you know, code here and code there. Um, it seems more understandable to me uh, you know, that the QML part is, is easier to grasp. You see, um, we provide um, a lot of components library, all of which is uh, in every, every um, element of an of a application and the user interface. Um, it's declarative. Uh, you, you see the grid units um, of your app, um, and you can just keep going. Whereas this here, I'm again, for not the best developer, seems a little bit more decoupled. Um, I don't know. It's, it, I think it's a, it's a choice, of, it's a personal choice, um, what you want to do there. Now, on the, the HTML5 side, this is that we have. Um, a container is based on Oxide, um, which is the um, engine that powers Chromium and Chrome. Um, and so you get the power of, of that goodness. Um, and then Oxide itself, we already hooked it up for you to integrate with our shell. So if you're Gmail, for example, which you ship on the phone with a web app, and whenever you have a new um, email pop up, you know, the application 
all the functions in the container, and the container will do the necessary stuff on the shell. Um, scopes. So that's um, those are mockups from the film. Um, and if you think about your your iPhone or Android phone, you about to phone, if you have one, um, there is typically you just have an app bridge. You have desktop and there's icons on there, maybe widgets or gadgets, like a, you know, the better forecast or so. So that's about it. And um, if you want to get, you know, read tweets or Facebook, you have to start a perspective application to access your information. It's, you always have to go down one path and come back, switch the app and go to, you know, the other source. And so, um, we thought of scopes as something that, as a um, information surfacing framework that allows you, as a developer, a um, couple of things. First, you can have, you can easily get front and center on the phone, right? So your whatever starts screen, the screen, but as soon as you turn this way on, right? That's the prime real estate on your phone. That's where you want to be as an app developer. So that's where all the attention goes. Um, doing that. You know, for Samsung and stuff, it's really hard because you might then be one of many app icons there, but that's about it, right? If you even manage to be pre-installed. Now, Scopes allows you, it takes one, one of those thresholds out because um, you can surface the information, the content of your app um, right there. It's still, you know, discussion between you and the OEM hardware partner, you know, whether you want to be, or should, will be part of the um, the center stage, um, but the user then can choose to you know customize that experience. So, um, what we see here is um, different we call categories, um, and categories can be a lot of things. Um, the ever powerful aspect of scopes is as we want to surface information, you know, we can overwhelm somebody easily with just content. So um, there's uh, a mechanism built in how you can aggregate information. So if you look at, for example, the music skill, you can have multiple data sources. Um, so for example, like local songs and then a query to the internet to like groove sharp and albums. And that is aggregated in one view. And that's something that the scope does. Um, now, Information surfacing without search capabilities is kind of useless. Um, so, um, there, whenever you query a scope, it'll take your search to all those um, aggregated scopes and show that and bring that back to you. Um, we have adopted for that um, a Google Scolang, um, which is a concurrent language. Um, I think it's a good Robin getting more and more traction in the field. It's always been like, you know, is it the right decision or not? But um, it's really, our developers like that it's um, very easy to write safe code, um, bug-free code, also bug-free, but it's really easy to put the software design code. Um, one thing that we got lots of flack for on the desktop, because scopes have also started to have started on the desktop, is privacy. Um, some of you that might follow Ubuntu more closely, there's, um, there's the Amazon scope um, and FSF, Stallman, you know, we're complaining that Ubuntu is sending your user data, your queries off to the internet, and it's all bad. It was forgotten was that there was a switch where you could just turn it off, you know, be notified the users. Um, but having learned that lesson, um, we built in a stronger framework where you can, based on like, sub-elements of the scope, turn it on, turn it off, so you're in full control of what happens to your data. And your browser does the same thing, right? So it's kind of, um, I think we were just a good attack surface there for, for other reasons. Um, go to your task or your browser or somewhere else, um, you know, the same thing happens. Now, this is the aggregation that I was talking about. Um, so, it's a video scope where you see like your local videos and then popular clips from, say, YouTube or whatever, Vimeo. Um, 
kick off a query is sent to all the um, aggregated scopes um, over time as time flows. It's all network, asynchron, laggy, some servers might be up, some not, some might be responding fast, some might not respond ever. Um, but you will get um, data back and then it will be you know, in an easy way um, displayed and rendered for you. So what you see here is a carousel and, and a grid layout. And the powerful thing is with the aggregation, there's, you know, the, somebody wrote my videos and somebody wrote popular clips. And you have, like, the idea of, like, my cat videos. And so you just write cat video scope that aggregates um, results from local videos and popular clips. And where you, as the cat video author, can then aggregate only the relevant information that's coming from YouTube and, and Vimeo. So you can inherit um, existing scopes quite easily and, and query them accordingly. Now, going back to the like prime real estate aspect that I mentioned earlier, it's great if you're you know, front and center of the film, but if it doesn't look like your app doesn't have your identity and your brand, it's kind of pointless. You would put it in a It just looks great. And so here are a couple of um, examples like what branding elements um, you can do. Um, um, we have a Weber Channel scope uh, that's fully branded that has you know Weber Channel logo in here. Um, you can have like your a little footprint of your of your logo and, and everything there. Um, there's previews and so, and so forth. So it's it's fully customizable for you as a developer. And the good thing is it's all done in a JSON file, so it's it's independent of the actual logic of the actual code. Um, and so we provide you with a couple of um, predetermined layouts, um, cards that you can configure. A card is essentially always a single node in the tree of the information you're displaying, and we always assume that there's you know a picture and some description and then other metadata that will be rendered you know depending on on the layout. And so that's that's the, the power of scopes. In the description of the session, I was also talking about like uh, image updates and, and the click patch in format. I've kind of skipped that because we just recently announced something, a technology uh, which is called Snappy, um, which is sort of superseding that. So I wanted to talk about Snappy for a little bit. Um, we're really targeting makers, so people that take a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or whatever. Uh, and build, you know, gimmicks with it. You know, I wasn't aware that people get this, and I still have to figure out what it is. But you know, people, people that, that are done, yeah, in that, that movement, you know, it's kind of what we try to address with Snappy. Um, and so, let's just start here. If you, you have this great idea and you want to build like a drone, for example, um, you know, we'll have the controller board on there that does all the balancing. Sensor um, stuff, but that's where your IP is, right? This is where where your work goes, and you don't really want to be bothered with bringing up Raspbian or whatever OS on that platform, right? You want to focus on writing your app, making that work nice. So you don't want to necessarily be bothered with maintaining a whole operating system. And so this is where Snappy comes in, where we provide you with a way um, to get a system image that you can deploy on your device, um, where we take care of the kernel and everything that's in the hardware enablement department. Um, we provide it with an OS, and the core, so it's not you want to core, is um, just, you know, a minimal system choose, as it was called in the past. Um, and then we have the notion of frameworks that could be, you know, what you know as libq, for example, or it could larger framework, larger set of libraries. Um, and then apps that sit on top of that or sit on top of the OS. Um, they're all self-contained, so static linking, which is good, which is bad, you can argue that. Uh, but for the use case that we are addressing here, um, again, you want to worry about your part of the device, your part of the stack. You don't necessarily want to worry about whether there's an older version of Raspbian. Of, you know, PHP or Perl version, if you 
have to, to stay on top, you know, stuff like that. So we give you the power to just be isolated and have that um, uh, independence. And so this would be uh, your app, your contribution, or how you'd like to write the app, potentially the framework. And if there's specific like hardware enablement to you, that would be in what we call a gadget snap. And those are individual parts that snap together. That's going to be an analogy there. Um, and then if you want to take it to a product, so the example we have here is um, a webcam demo, just a webcam server, where you have an RHF based board, I don't know if this is an eagle or whatever, um, and a webcam. So you take the, the RHF uh, image, um, put a bunch of core on, because you really just the kernel shell, probably a web server, um, which would already be up here, and then the Webcam demo gadget would essentially be enabling the camera so that if you need a specific driver that's not there, then you go in there into the webcam demo gadget. That in itself isn't necessarily exciting, but there's a couple of key features. Um, so, where we take um, responsibility for updating those co OS part pieces um, transactional with. Um, we have an AP partition scheme. Um, we can do canary updates. So if your system you know, sees there's new um, updated components in the store, it, you're running on one partition on the A partition, and it will install it and be able to run the tests and checks and health checks on the B partition. If that fails, you know, just roll back and, and the user isn't interrupted. Um, um, if the test succeeds, the, the system will reboot you. You know, a window as to when your system wants to reboot or should reboot, um, and we'll switch off the B partition. Now, if for whatever reason the system doesn't boot entirely, um, Snappy will detect that, roll you back into the working A partition, and you're good to go, right? So there's minimal downtime for the users while getting that constant stream of updates. Um, we're also addressing a lot of like the board vendors, so. We want to enable like whole families of boards um, as part of our offering um, so that you can just go and buy a standard board, like a developer platform called our board Raspberry Pi, so that people don't, you know, and be good. You don't have to worry about which distribution to download best. Um, so I'm um, working with the vendors together. Um, and then for all those frameworks and apps, we're called the source of sorceries. Um, so we're you know, uh, providing you with GitHub support in your Snap, so you can essentially define you know, which GitHub project you want to have in your Snap. And then the build tool will build that statically linked Snap um, for you. And, you know, you can always stay on top of your devil branch. Um, so that's what Snappy is. Um, I think we just, Mark announced the, Shuttle have announced the first version of this Monday because we're doing our watch online summit this week as well. Uh, and so we, with the release of 1504, um, a couple of weeks ago, Snappy Core is now available as well. So if you, you know, have uh, use cases there, if you're a maker, you know, I would like to invite you to use that technology. Good. That's the end of the presentation. Um, been a lot of questions during the talk. Do you have any any questions at this point? Like, I think it would be how many links? Um, I was curious on the phones. Should people use their own custom channels? Like, no, no. Um, not on the Ubuntu phones, anyways. Um, because the integration, the the display server. Um, between the shell, mm -hmm. GNOME, uh, or KDE, and the, the display manager isn't there, right? It's not in our interest to do that. We don't want to block out the GNOME community to do it, but for us, we have chosen to be our shell. Um, so we're happy to help people do it, but you know, we probably won't do it in the foreseeable future. Um, yeah. So it is possible to replace the window manager with another? 
like with Gnome, if they were to update their stuff to support more Premiere. So the question was that there, so once Gnome supports Premiere, yeah. would it be possible? Can you just swap out Unity? Like it's not like in your login manager, like on, on right now in your login manager you can choose different sessions on your desktop. Um, that's not implemented because again we feel strongly about the look and feel and the design patterns and conversions. And GNOME has a different design language than we have. So your user experience wouldn't necessarily what we wanted to see from a bunch of device. So we don't provide that sort of convenient shortcut. Technically if you are able to configure them like the app. It's not, we don't block it either. We don't offer it. But we don't block it so I haven't looked too closely at Ubuntu phones, but um, when you work with the hardware vendors, do you actually get custom phones, or is it really the same hardware that you know the Android's running on, or whatever? So we have two commercial products that are shipping today. So this is on Mesa MX4, and if you want to check it out, feel free to come up after the talk. Um, that's the same hardware as they ship with, with Android. So we're going to do any customizations or anything for And same for the BQ device that we shipped at the very first. It's the same exact hardware. Again, that's our selling proposition. It's, people are like, you know, I can sell phones with Android and iOS. You know. <laughs> so what? Uh, so our our proposition is that we like have zero or close to zero like enablement costs and change costs to the one. So they can take devices that they already should and just put them on the chest or put them onto an end. Does Canonical do that? Are, they, are you is that the company that actually well, it's, buys it's, the phones it, in bulk and then it's a partnership. Them? So we we work with the OEMs to get devices um, in house that we then bring up and enable. Just make sure that this part here particularly works. You know, the back compatibility that I was I mentioned earlier, very can use um, all the, the functions from from the Android drivers and, you know, that it works well there. Um, and then we provide them with an image, but the image in itself is the same. It's the same code base that we then push to Mesu and to DQ, and we have like the Google Nexus devices as our reference. So it's the same code base that will go onto all those devices. Right. Um, some self-advertisement. Um, I'm going to talk about the phone specifically tomorrow. I think it's 11.30 again. Um, and then I'm also talking a little bit more about scopes if you don't want to go to sessions there. In the phone um, session, I will bring phone tablet, I'm not sure if I'm going to show you a T8 on here, but you, you can actually, like, if I want to give it to you, you can have a hands-on experience if you want to play with it, if you're curious. And then scopes is at 4 o'clock, and I'm just going to try, I'm not scared to write the scope. <laughs> so, we'll see. Any more questions? Okay. And thank you for your attention, and enjoy your lunch, because that's the agenda right now. Thank you.